Welcome everyone to Leveraging Data Integration for Strategic GIS Governance. Today I am joined by both Leslie and Dean. So Leslie, would you like to give a quick intro to yourself? Sure, I'm Leslie. Uh, I work for one of SAFE's partners in um, Canada. Um, we have been partners with SAFE for at least 20 years now, I guess. And uh, we do sort of offer all services around, you know, FME, FME server, development, coaching, consulting, training. Um, so we've been working and I've been working with Concert Tech for uh, 18 years and uh, love FME, obviously, very much. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm uh, Dean uh, with SAFE, and I've, uh, yeah, I actually didn't re realize that, uh, Leslie, um, I guess I've been with SAFE about the same time you've been with Concert Tech, so that's an interesting uh, co coincidence. And I work with Mark Stokes in the um, um, strategic experts team, and so we do everything from uh, like pilots and prototypes, uh, sort of for knowledge transfer, uh, and the other thing that I, uh, one of my roles is product manager for open standards. So I do a fair bit of liaison work with groups like uh, the OGC and, and and over the years with Inspire and Building Smart and groups like that. So, yeah. Awesome. And speaking of Mark Stokes, um, Mark will be joining us on the back end for some Q&A. So... If you do have any questions throughout the webinar, definitely leave those under the questions tab on the bottom right. Um, and Mark will be keeping an eye on that. And then we will also have a live Q&A session at the end. Um, chat, you're all using it to let us know where you're tuning in from. So keep on doing that, we'd love to see it. Share your reactions with us during the webinar as well. There's a button in the middle on the bottom. And then if you do have any audio issues, click that button on the bottom left. There's four simple steps for troubleshooting and tip, the first one is usually refreshing your page if, you have, if you're having any issues there. If you would like to download the deck and follow along with us live, you can do so by clicking the top right button there. And as I understand it, we actually have some bonus slides in there as well. Is that right, Dean? That's correct. Yeah, most of my decks have a bit of bonus in it. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely download those as a resource and we'll also um, send those out in the follow-up email. All right, and at this point, I'll get our presenters to turn off our webcam so we can save on some bandwidth for some upcoming demos. And I'll pass it back to Dean once we've done that for the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, so yeah, this is a quick overview of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, first of all, we'll give you an intro to what we're actually talking about when we're, you know, when we're discussing data and GIS governance and why why is this an important topic or why you should be interested. Uh, then we'll dive into how FME supports data governance. What sort of are the some of our the key capabilities on the FME platform, uh, and then we'll look at um, you know how FME is used that way, and then we'll look at a few demos. Um, related to governance that, you know, from FME working with uh, metadata and other types of uh, validation. And uh, Leslie will go into some uh, real world examples after I talk a bit about best practices and, uh, and then we'll look at some trends going forward. So, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time there uh, for, for Q and A as well. So why don't we, uh, have a quick poll before uh, we dive in, just to get some of your impressions about uh, governance. So if everyone wants to head down to that polls tab on the bottom right, I've launched it there. We'll give everyone a few moments here to place their votes. Yeah, and there's a few options, so take your time to look over those. And we tried to include an agnostic option at the bottom there, if you're not yet convinced that governance is for you yet. Okay, it looks like we have the majority voted now. And it looks like better data management is a key, key one here. 60% of people would say that's the primary motivation. Yeah. 
And then I guess okay. number two would be improved decision making. So ultimately, yeah, why are we, why do we need better data and better data management? Ultimately, that's for the end users of the data. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for your voting there. And we do have a few people yet to convince that uh, governance is important. So let's see if we can do that. There we go. Okay, so in terms of uh, why should we bother with governance, um, some some people might consider that uh, governance is a bit uh, of a dry topic. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, why do we need to do governance? And, um, um, you know, what is, it sounds a little bit uh, bureaucratic. And, uh, you know, I, actually, if you think about it, uh, well, it might might not sound that exciting. Uh, if there's two aspects here. It, first of all, it can save you from a lot of pain because if you do have bad data, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to clean that up. And the other thing is, uh, good data or good data quality can actually enable you to do some pretty exciting stuff. So we'll we'll see a couple of examples in the, in a minute. And another aspect is that um, the more data volume uh, complexity of data and the more updates you have to do, the more you need good governance and automation in order uh, to manage your data. So at the end of the day, kind of like uh, some people from the poll, um, the decision, the quality of your decisions are going to be limited by uh, the quality of your data. And here's a quote from uh, Matthew Lewin from Esri. Governance is, you know, one of the most important factors determining whether or not uh, you're your GIS will actually be successful. So let's just run uh, this demo quick. So why are we looking at an airport? Uh, in this particular case, it's a digital twin. And uh, what does this have to do with data governance? Well, the bottom line here is that this digital twin would not be possible uh, without good data and good data governance, because um, this is not just a pretty picture. Uh, it's actually a lot of it's built on top of a BIM, so a building information model, which has a lot of standards itself. And so it is a very rich data model where you can click every single object here, has schedules associated with it for maintenance. It has all of the different parts that went into building it. And to make it a digital twin, it also has a real time data, data feeds telling you what the status of, of all these different components are. Uh, and uh, you know, whether they're working or not, or something needs maintenance, which can automatically, you know, generate work orders, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's, we can go to the next slide. So, yeah, I just wanted to give a sort of a nice visual example as to why, why governance is important. Yeah, and just to continue maybe on that and maybe give a, a bit of a definition, because like we usually like to start these presentations with saying, you know, what what do we see by governance? So we're kind of looking at data governance and GIS governance overall in general. So I usually like to say there is room in the sandbox for all the castles, but we have to agree on how to share the sand. So there is all kinds of exciting projects that we can do. Um, but you know, uh, it, it does it does take some work to to keep those things going and to make them live over time. Um, and then I just put two quotes that that are from a blog article. I don't know if the links work in them. That will be something Elizabeth has to <laughs> maybe check. But um, so that you know, so these these quotes are from articles from Esri and 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 stuff like that. And being data governance is the idea of managing the availability and the usability of our data and the security. And GIS governance is kind of overall, like, you know, that includes not just our data, but also our systems, um, you know, you know, even, even the people that are going to work with it. So how does it help us? Um, I like to think of it like from, from this point of view, because I'm kind of like Dean, it's like governance doesn't always sound like the most exciting uh, I idea sometimes, but when you think about what it allows you to do, that's what's really uh, exciting. So um, how does it help us? Well, if you want to build something really significant and, you know, and you want it to, you know, last over time um, and it, in, 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 our, in the world now, that's, you know, multi-user, multi-systems, multi, multiple platforms 
and where GIS data is getting kind of like integrated into other business processes and lines, this is this is where governance really comes into play because um, this this is what really allows us to really build something significant and uh, exciting. And these are just some of the benefits that you get from implementing governance, right? I think uh, at the end of the day, customer service improvements, I think that's that's an improved decision making. I think those ones are really key ones for, for me because you can have all the greatest tools in the world, but if the data is unreliable, then you're not going to draw useful decisions from it. And I think that's pretty like pretty much the baseline of this, right? This is from Matthew Lewin's article from Esri on sort of the, you know, the different uh, domains of governance in GIS. And we're not really going to speak to all of them today. Obviously, like there's there's a few, though, that I feel like are interesting highlights for where FME helps the organization uh, make a play. And if you include FME more as a platform uh, in your organization, then you know you can reach uh, new levels for these uh, these specific these specific domains. So one of them might be like platform, for instance. We see platform, we see our enterprise GIS being you know talked of as a platform now. So we used to have software and applications. Uh, now we have platforms and they live in an ecosystem with many others. If we think of FME now more as a platform and instead of just thinking of it as an ETL tool or that sort of Swiss Army knife that I can, you know, create like cool scripts with and I really think about it as something that's going to be integral to my system, this will allow me to do more. And then the obvious one is data. I mean, you know, for data, FME is, is obviously comes easily to the forefront we have uh, the idea of being able to make sure our data is good quality. Uh, FME can help us put validation measures into place. Those validation measures could be from data coming into systems, data going out, data across systems. So the same data that might appear in different, applic in different applications or different systems and make sure, making sure they're coherent. So I think FME plays obviously like a great role there. And, you know, that kind of ties into the idea of delivery, too, because delivery in GIS might include like delivery of our tools, our mapping tools, delivery of mapping tools integrated into other applications and other business lines. It might be delivering, you know, web apps, field apps, things like that. But delivery is also delivering data and, you know, to specific groups or tiers, maybe for compliance. And this is this is where we do see a, a really good role for FME and making sure that we sort of curate in a sort of predictable fashion how the data is delivered in a consistent way, in a monitored way. And then the last one where maybe people don't think of it too much is workforce for me. Um, you know, we're kind of in a world now where uh, your GIS system uh, might outlive a lot of your staff. I think that, you know, in the last years, we've seen a lot of retirements, but also seen a lot of people shift around. And I think that you want to be able to have that that flexibility and that ability to keep your workforce up to date on all the changing technologies uh, and also be able to provide, you know, fast tools like low code solutions like FME is so that somebody can come in and the learning curve is is much lower. Yeah, I like that idea of institutional knowledge, capturing that and formalizing it so that it's not just a couple of whizzy scripts that are, you know, black boxes that are keeping your organization running. Yeah. And we have lots of examples of, you know, old code and things left behind and then other new people have to come in and try to figure out, you know, how are we going to, you know, keep the system going that, you know, we, we don't necessarily have, you know, all the information about. So uh, this is where I like that a lot too. Thanks, Dean. In case anybody is uh, not necessarily aware or uh, of all the components of FME or what makes FME now more of an enterprise integration platform uh, rather than, you know, traditionally just a tool to, you know, convert data between formats, let's say, um, you know, when you think of all the tools that make up the FME platform, you really see that it's more of an automation tool now, an integration tool, and not just a, a transfer of data. So the main, uh, you know, applications that make up this platform, I usually like to categorize them as, you know, we have FME desktop. So this is what allows us to build our workflow. So I usually tell people, you can build your data processes with FME desktop, and you can run them in the desktop, uh, execute them. 
uh, create them, you know, develop them. And this is where you're really um, trying to um, develop how your data is going to be processed, manipulated, written, validated, you know, all the things you might, depending on what kind of integration workflow you're dealing with. And then we sort of have the, the automation aspect of FME, and we see that with both FME Server and FME Cloud. So FME Cloud being the SaaS version and FME Server being the enterprise application. This graphic, I always like it because it's evolved so much. Like in the 18 years, like I've been at ConcertTech, this graphic has existed, yet it has evolved. It used to be a graphic showing individual data formats Know, like uh, oh we support map info and then we support esri and then we support you know uh, you know cad and then we support different uh, specific formats and now it's basically different types of data and a lot that have a spatial component to them and so we kind of actually see the evolution of spatial data over time in general and how fme has evolved to kind of keep up in those like newer spaces that we see data that has you know 3d or a spatial component to it so, and we see that the complexity is just definitely growing with time. All right. So I'll take over here and show a, a couple of, um, of demos. And uh, yeah, just just uh, run out, quickly go over this. Uh, and a quick comment. Thanks, Leslie, for, for that over, FME overview and kind of setting the stage of, of how FME uh, relates to governance and what we mean by governance. And uh, that I, I really like that format slide too. And I was just thinking, wow, like if you think about the whole range of data that you can access with FME, uh, that doesn't mean it's automatically going to be organized. So obviously, you need a good governance approach to to manage that degree of of diversity of data and volume. So one of the ways that I think is crucial for data management is to to, to have a handle on what kind of data you have and how to manage it is metadata. Because metadata tells you um, where your data is, how up to date it is, what's what's its uh, intended use, who, where does it come from, all that uh, contextual information. So the goal of this particular demo is we have a feature service um, which provides both data and metadata it needs to be updated based on some local metadata updates. So it's, let's say there's a local tool where somebody has uh, entered some information and, and uh, they need that those updates to go onto the feature service. The obstacle there, um, <clears throat> metadata typically in the, the ISO metadata that we're used to working with is fairly complex. It's a large nested XML document, a bit difficult to work with if you're used to flat uh, GIS data. So the solution is FME provides us with the uh, XSD XML Reader Writer uh, and then tools like XML Updater that makes it easy to detect changes and then make updates as needed. And so the result is feature service has metadata that is automatically updated according to uh, these latest updates and that, that merge basically happens. So let me just... Uh, this is kind of cool because it's actually not just a demo. This this particular workflow comes from Caltrans, so they were kind enough to share. Uh, this was kind of developed by Trent uh, at Safe, and, and he worked with them uh, to, to build this. And so this is actually being used in a in a production system. Uh, so basically, on the left side here, we have the metadata. The original metadata from the feature service and then the updates and they flow through here and uh, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can read this a bit easier and we'll just pop up a couple of the key transformers so here's the uh, change detector which looks for uh, changes in these attributes and we can drill into the uh, document structure of the XML using that tree control and look for changes and then based on those changes, uh, we do a number of updates here. And so this is these are all of the different uh, XML um, objects that we're going to update and merge in values that are coming from, from the update uh, document. And then ultimately here, uh, XML Updater uh, lets us merge those values right into the XML structure. So why are we doing it this way and not with, let's say, a flattener and a templater? Uh, the nice thing about 
if you're going from XML to XML, it's nice to use the updater because you don't have to kind of flatten and rebuild the whole structure. You can more surgically just insert the values where you need them to go. And ultimately it goes through a validator and, uh, and then out the, the text file reader. So I'll go ahead and run that quick. And you can see in this particular case, I'm just pushing through one update. And then if I go to here, you can see that this is the feature service data uh, with that linkage at the bottom. This is the update, which has additional information about contact information, it has a mod date, timestamp, and it has this bounds box. And then that gets merged into the output. So here you have a combination of the, the update dates and the new contact information and also the new B box, but it still has some of the old information from the feature service. So yeah, not, you know, not super uh, uh, visual, but it is a good example of how, you know, using, using uh, FME to automate uh, the metadata updates, which is pretty, pretty crucial for for uh, good data governance. And the next uh, example I'll show you quickly is metadata harvesting. And here, again, we wanna do some automation. And one of the things that people kind of eyes glaze over a bit when you talk about metadata, because it can be a pain if you have to go through and manually enter information. But in this, you know, FME can be used to automate harvesting of metadata and, and then doing updates that way. So this is actually, uh, I'll jump over to the workspace. And what this is doing is it's reading a, from a geo database and grabbing all of the uh, values and parameters from that data. Here, I'll just show you what the data set looks like. So this is just a Vancouver data set, probably from the training data. And you can see information about community centers, transit stations and whatnot. And so what we want to do is let's say we don't have any metadata and we just want to extract the metadata that's there. And so what this workflow is doing is it's reading the table names. It's uh, grabbing the uh, update timestamp, a unique ID, also auto-generating a category and a list of fields. So I'm not going to go through all of that. You can see here's the bounding box accumulator and the attribute exploder is what we use to, to generate all of the the field names and everything here in this case gets merged into this uh, XML template for the metadata. And then that gets uh, validated and written out. And so uh, if we look at the output for that, I can go ahead and run this. So it's reading all these tables, but it's only writing out one record per table. Uh, and then it has all the fields coming in as well for keywords. And so if we look at uh, the, up, the metadata for libraries, you can see uh, we have a list of uh, field names here, and uh, we also have that uh, dynamic bounds generated from the data. And the same thing goes for uh, the community centers, bounds and uh, keywords and, and other information. Uh, I think there was a category field too as well. So, all right, so back to the deck. How can FME support uh, your governance framework? What are some best practices? Uh, this is just sort of a high level snapshot of, of a governance plan. Some of the things that go into a plan or your governance policy, I'm not gonna go through everything, but the key thing is whatever you decide on for roles and responsibilities and how you're gonna manage the data life cycle, data management life cycle, FME can support uh, your ability to implement that every step of the way. Uh, so here's some aspects of how FME that you know, technically can help you implement your governance. And from, um, uh, let's say, the FME engine perspective, of course, we, we know that FME is an ideal tool to span uh, all the different uh, si silos of different types of data, different subsystems across your enterprise. And you can pull data from across those and manage data. Um, there's also a lot of tools in FME to help you validate your data in order to automate updates and make sure you're not corrupting it. Uh, I'll have a, uh, we have very good support for standards and I'll have some examples of that in a second. And uh, yeah, uh, validation, uh, we, we have a lot of tools both for geometry and uh, attribute validation. 
And at the end of the day, if in order to take all this information and make it easier to consume, we can help. We can we we support generating uh, like reports, which might be HTML, PDF, or log. You know, automated logging. And on the server side, we just you know you take that engine, and now you have full automation. And automation is really key for governance because now you have workflows that are reliable, repeatable, and uh, you can re remove that uh, human error aspect to it. And when you have that automation across the enterprise, so the data fusion across the enterprise, you can have workflows that span those subsystems. And uh, we've talked a bit about uh, uh, validation and updates already. Uh, and uh, lastly mentioned data distribution. So there's many aspects of data governance that, uh, that the server platform can su support you on. Things like access control security, and I, I kind of added notifications. We'll, we'll see an example of that uh, in some one of the customer examples. So a couple words on standards uh, before I show you my last example uh, or last demo example. And that is uh, we really have made standards a uh, 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 central component or a part of our, our planning and a roadmap. And so recently we had certification, uh, got certification for a number of the OGC standards, uh, the ones that are supported by the test suite. And uh, so for, you know, GML, GeoPackage, GeoTIFF and others. And uh, we have support for more than 30 OGC standards and there's more coming with OG, the Open API, OGC Features API, for example. Uh, so yeah, um, I think standards are really crucial because that's a way uh, in terms of governance where you can have an external standard that helps define your, in, your internal standards as well. And that way you can actually take tools that were developed by third parties. And as long as they're compliant with that standard, you can deploy them internally. So that it just gives you that sort of, that kind of governance just gives you sort of that, that extra scalability. Uh, and if, for example, one of the benefits we, we've are also emphasizing cloud native, so cloud optimized GeoTIFF, if you implement that standard, now you have that scalability in the cloud. And this we've already talked about metadata, but uh, there's a number of uh, standards there. Stack is a is an important uh, cloud native uh, data catalog that lets you consume uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF, for example. So a couple more words about validation. Mentioned we, we cover validation of metadata, schema, and the data content itself. And there's just a few transformers that uh, are really helpful. Uh, things like attribute validator or geometry validator and tester would probably be the, the top ones there. Uh, so there's lots of tools there to support uh, data validation. And we have some really good examples in on our knowledge base. And just to wrap up in terms of my demos, uh, I'll show you, I just wanted to show you a quick example of the IMD validator. So moving beyond metadata to data content, and this really covers um, both uh, geometry and business rules for the attribution. And so here's an example of the validation report. And if I just click on this, I can go to the actual report. You can see that it's got, uh, you know, Geofence has an interior ring. That means there's a donut when it's just supposed to be a single polygon, area polygon. So we're doing both geometry checks. And if we go further down, there's um, <clears throat> lots of data content checks on, on you know, unique IDs um, or missing IDs, valid start times. And then if we go to the very bottom, we can actually see a, a visual representation of the Victoria Airport uh, we can zoom in, click on a specific ID and say, okay, there's a problem with that particular amenity and I can search that ID and go back to that line in the table and figure out what the error was. So this is just an example of a validation report for a very complex um, standard. So the IMDF standard, even the format is simple based on GeoJSON, but the business rule set is probably one of the most complex ones we've encountered. And so you really do need automation if you're going to comply uh, with that standard. So that's basically 
all I was going to say. I just wanted to give that example. I thought uh, the indoor mapping does really relate uh, to data governance because it shows, you know, in this particular case, uh, complying with that standard. And it also links in a bit with digital twin, which will, which was our first example. And I'll get back to that a little later. So I'll pass it over to uh, Leslie and, and you're gonna talk about some uh, real world customer examples where FME is used to support uh, governance. Yep. So the first use case I wanna talk about is actually a tool that we built for uh, multiple clients in Quebec uh, for the management of their cadastral data. So um, it's just an example of where you really have to think about the idea that like the data is always changing in the in the management of this uh, of this and you, their uh, cities are basically constantly receiving new cadastral updates that they have to integrate into their parcel fabric and then they actually have to have to um, pu publish the data back out to a different minis provincial ministry in um, in a very very specific open format in a, in a GML format with a very specific and strict schema. So this is an ongoing need. So it's not like you you know like maybe a long time ago you might make a map and then spend weeks and weeks and weeks and then you have the perfect map. It is now the published map. This is living data and it has to constantly be updated. Uh, but you have to maintain its quality and maintaining its quality means being able to adhere to the different standards you need, making sure that the data is coherent so that it can then be used in other business processes. So the data that always gets received is in a very specific format in a DXF format. And so it does not match the internal format that you know, organizations use to manage their cadastral data. So they need to be able to manage their own data in their own format for their business needs to integrate with all their other systems and applications. So it's their governed cadastral fabric, but then they have to be able to constantly bring in data from the outside and constantly push data um, back out uh, in, in these other formats. So by looking at, you know, a gover the governance of this, um, system, you have to be able to think this is not static and it's constantly going to change. So I have to be able to have tools that let me convert the data, have tools that let me validate that it's correct. I need to be able to maintain and use the data in my own format, in my own system. And then I need to also be able to constantly be able to, you know, at any moment produce a set in this external format. So the tools that we, um, that we did are mostly FME based. Um, and so they automatically take in those external DXF files. Um, but we have to do validation because even though there's a very strict standard on how the data is supposed to be formatted, it is not always perfect. Um, it's a it's a it's a very it's a very specific format, it, kind of like a distributed GIS. So it's it's basically CAD files, but you can reconstruct GIS data from those CAD files. Um, and so, you know, in the processes, we're actually having to validate to make sure that it's structurally coherent to be able to then import the tool into the current parcel fabric. So then we import the data into the database at the end, um, and then that allows them to do their business with it, right? Integrate those par that parcel data with, you know, other applications and systems and serve their business processes. And then we also use FME at the at the end of that to extract the data to the very specific GML format with a very specific schema that really doesn't match with a city needs for its business needs, right? But that is a great open format for the province because they're trying to get data from many municipalities across the whole province. So they need something that's standardized so that they can integrate for their needs and their system. So they chose an open standard to be able to have a sort of neutral platform with a certain standard. So we need to be able to adhere to that standard. So even on the export, there has to be validation that the FME workspace is doing to make sure the data coherently meets that standard. So that's where, you know, I feel like, you know, in that idea of like sort of like data intake and validation, there are some other examples I have from clients, you know, we have newer and newer ways, like, you know, there's LIDAR data now, there's, you know, all kinds of data that, that, that comes in or that we might hire, you know, outside firms to collect for us. And usually we end up with only a very specific window of time to accept that data. And so we need to be able to have ways to be able to respond 
in a timely fashion so that we can make sure the data is, uh, is good and fit for purpose, basically. Um, this is uh, another example. This is uh, the city of Sudbury, and they were asked by the um, by the auditor to put in a system to allow them to monitor road patrol activities and to provide a solid data basis for residents' claims. So one of the needs was that they would get resident claims and they wouldn't have the data or the information available to them to be able to uh, verify or validate or, you know, get a clear picture of the circumstances from a data perspective. Uh, one of the obstacles of this is, you know, a lot of these kind of systems sound pretty straightforward. Okay, the guys who are doing the public uh, roads maintenance, they're going to collect the data, um, but different people need it for different purposes. So they may need it to do their own management and their own dashboards. Uh, but then the uh, risk management people, they need to be able to extract that information for resident claims. And so they need the information in a consistent manner. And you need, and if you're going to use this data in potentially litigation cases and stuff like that, you need to be able to have an idea of the whole lineage of the data, right? How was it collected? Where was it collected? You know, how was the data extracted from the system in a consistent fashion? Um, you know, if you if you have a person trying to do the data extraction, um, you know, maybe it won't be done the same way every time. Um, maybe some of the data will be missing. Are we pointing to the right data? Are we even if we're running FME desktop, are we running the right workspace? So this is where when you, you have FME as a platform and you have your GIS as a, you know, you, your GIS governance in place and you have your enterprise GIS in place, you can put in governance around that so you know how the data is being curated. And one of the nice things about using like FME server and these kinds of integrations is you also not only have, you know, FME workspaces that sort of, you know, curate how the data is extracted and how it's provided, how it's validated, but you also get that sort of traceability of when was it run? When was the data extracted? What did it connect to? You, you sort of have a full like lineage of that data at the end, which becomes important if you're going to find yourself using that data for, you know, official activities and stuff like that. So this is just another graphic showing what they actually did. So their actual solution, because they had multiple audiences, they had looked at buying specific tools for this, but realized they had FME as a platform, they had an enterprise GIS, and they had the tools they needed to be able to put something in place in-house, something that's flexible and that was able to adapt as they kind of brought actually these different groups into also a change management like when you look at the human side of it you know you're asking new people people in the field to collect data where they weren't doing that before you're asking their managers to work with you know dashboards and information they've never done this before so fme because it's so flexible it allowed them to phase the project as well um and and definitely that helped with the change management so for them Phase one was they, they deployed quick capture in order to capture the GIS, uh, the information in the field, uh, you know, as to what they were doing for road patrol. Um, but then the phase two, they developed an FME workspace that would automatically compile all the deficiencies that were found and then email a report to the managers. And this was a transitory phase to help them get used to the idea of the changes they were dealing with in terms of like, okay, now you have all this new information that you didn't have before. What do you need? How are you interacting with it? And stuff like that. Um, then after that, they made a switch. And this is where FME is so great because it allows them to like readapt as they can sort of improve the business processes. They created a dashboard um, for the for the uh, for for the managers to see what was going on, but now we shift FME's role into producing the data to meet those dashboard needs. So FME made a shift in terms of what its purpose was there, and these are easy to do because it's you know a light tool in terms of development. You're able to basically you know it's a low code solution. You're able to fit it where it needs to go. Phase four, um, they use, so for those people that actually need that report, okay, hey, there was an incident, a resident needs information or something like that. So the risk management people are able to use an ArcGIS survey one, two, three form, and they make a request. And on the back end, this is where FME's automation is. Uh, FME automatically, you know, through the webhook 
technology and FME server is able to run a workspace that retrieves the required information. And this is where the governance comes into place. We have a repeatable pattern that we can trace. We know where the data is coming from and emails them the report back to the requester. And at the end of this, they added even more in automation into the workflow. And FME is playing a role you see at multiple places in order to serve the data out to the different um, works uh, to the different uh, players or stakeholders in this. So basically they have automation of the creation of the work orders in CityWorks. So now they can create, you know, a case in quick capture and then FME is vetting the type of case and creating the type proper type of work order for their work order management system. So you can see that there's a number of stakeholders that need the same information, but in different ways. And by, you know, bringing that FME platform in, they're able to sort of make sure that they know where where the data is coming from, how it's being processed, when it's being processed, and in a timely manner. So that, that I found was a fun one. And then the last one, I don't have a cool graphical slide for, but this is just one that we see for those who might be interested in this sort of thing. Like the idea of like being able to do data validation to comply to standards is really important. So Dean talked a lot about standards, right? Some standards are more like the formatting of, of data. And some standards are very specific data standards. So uh, above and, you know, schema and, um, you know, uh, rules in terms of how the data needs to be, um, uh, provided and produced. So like, for instance, um, you know, uh, as a lot of cities in North America are moving to like next gen 911, uh, Nina, the organization that manages the GIS standard, uh, has created a new standard um, to meet the needs of that the next gen 911 environment. So um, one of the particularities of next gen 911 is that the spatial data will play an integral role in how calls are routed. And because of that, um, you know, you know, it is, is it is going to be important that, you know, the GIS data is clean and good. And one of the obstacles that a lot of organizations that have to do the uh, aggregation of 911 data face is the idea that the address data is constantly changing. So we're dealing with address data, we're dealing with boundaries. Um, boundaries of like police zones, city boundaries, uh, you know, the 911 uh, dispatch boundaries and stuff like that. And now, you know, if you can think like, you know, a lot of us are GIS people in the room, what are the challenges we might face? So we're constantly bringing in new roads uh, or editing the roads data, right? Think about every like road construction, like create new deviations off road paths and things like that. So we're they're constantly having to remerge multiple jurisdictions of data, so, you know, and that can mean quite volumes of data and there's always changes. And if you follow the next gen 911 uh, standards and rules, you see that actually, um, you know, in the future, the idea is that addresses have to be, you know, updated in the system within 72 hours. So, um, you know, that that also can kind of like the timeliness brings its own challenges as well. Um, so we have worked with different clients, um, one in particular to help automate these validations. So this is part of larger systems. Again, FME in, you know, as a platform. So we're talking about FME server automated in order to be able to take that new that in that take that data and be able to validate it against, you know, possibly in some cases, hundreds of rules, literally. And those rules span from schema rules, are the, are the required attributes filled out? Um, this spans to uh, geometry rules, are the ge geometry structurally sound, but also topological rules, especially around the boundaries, which are going to, which play an important role in this. So I did want to be able to say like, you know, FME, when, when we're trying to comply to standards and meet needs for fit for purpose for very specific data purposes, um, you know, we, we, we do see a lot of use cases here. Dean. All right, thanks, Leslie. Yeah, you know, some great examples from uh, from Quebec, Sudbury, and uh, NextGen 911. And uh, so I'm going to talk briefly. I know we're winding down on time here, so I'll keep it pretty short. Um, about another example, so NextGen 911 is an example of a sort of a cross-jurisdictional standard. So the NextGen 911 applies to all of North America. At, you know, it's at different stages or at different rates. 
And the uh, European Environment Agency has to manage data right across all of Europe, so 33 countries. And there's a standard there called Inspire that kind of is behind all this. And so they have to ingest data from all across Europe, from and every country has got sort of their own different language, their different uh, internal standards. And so they've come up with um, the Inspire standard uh, that allow people to aggregate data, but they still get, so there's different levels of implementation of Inspire. And so they have to still accept legacy data in the form of Excel and shape files, um, CSV files, as well as things like uh, Inspire GML. So th this is a, obviously a very complex system and they're running something like 16 FME servers continuously and they have all these automated workflows uh, using FME. So if you think about a governance challenge, managing all of the EU's data is, is obviously a pretty pretty huge challenge. Uh, and so, yeah, it's another snapshot of the problem. In, you know, get regular updates basically in, you know, every day, if not every hour um, from all these member states and then validate that uh, and then extract the data from that and bring it into their, their system. So yeah, something like 11,000 jobs a day. And this is a European Environment Agency working with uh, Swaco. So there's lots of, there's some great uh, webinars on this if you're interested. Another, uh, I guess this is now going international. So the, uh, the Red Cross has a mandate to support humanitarian aid right around the world. Um, you know, every, everything from, uh, you know, things like promoting health, uh, things you know, responding to the pandemic to say the, the latest uh, disaster in, in Turkey and Syria. And so they have to monitor data on a global basis. They have automated web feeds that do web scraping. And uh, then they have a number of data products, both in terms of a dashboard, uh, at the administrative sort of at management level so they can see where hotspots are and uh, where they may need to respond as well as building data packages that can be used offline things like uh, pdf and whatnot that uh, where there's low connectivity and so that's obviously a huge uh, data management challenge and this is just a snapshot of one part of it is you know if they're going to conflate data again from different countries and they have to respond let's say to so a disaster something like the earthquake where where you have data they have to conflate across international borders uh you know obviously there's uh they need some automated tools that help them uh make the, the data more consistent and the other thing that's always a challenge is how do you uh manage uh, a system you know the kind of Leslie mentioned earlier, sort of this whole ecosystem idea where you have very complex architectures with you know, parts of your system might be Cardo DB, other parts are from Esri or Microsoft, and uh, maybe some open source uh, components, PostGIS. So FME allows you, helps you to manage the, the, that whole architecture and you can actually um, move data where you need it to go, manage it and uh, report on it. So a good example of that is PowerLink. Uh, so this is, you know, again, on the sort of emergency management side for a large utility in uh, Eastern Australia, uh, Queensland. And so their challenge is they have to monitor their whole system and uh, anticipate impacts coming from large, let's say extreme weather events, uh, storms, floods, fires, that sort of thing. And then when they anticipate uh, problems, they have to send out notifications uh, to emergency managers so that they can position resources to, to respond as needed. And so these are some of the products that they generate. This is all actually done with FME. And uh, so these most of these are PDF maps showing things like storm tracks. And the other main aspect of this is the notification system. So they have notifications that go out where they, you know, they anticipate, as they understand more about the storm track or if there's a fire, what areas are under threat, 
they generate notifications that go to the different um, utility uh, service uh, and managers there so that they can respond. And the other aspect of notifications is from a governance perspective, which is really important here, is they, um, they actually have statistics and uh, reports that they generate periodically showing the uptime of the system and any time there's you know, any issues. So, so in terms of governance, they have uh, certain standards that they require in terms of you know, minimal downtime and the length of time it takes to, to uh, generate notifications. So they have sort of this dashboard or overview uh, reporting structure there uh, that shows you know, how many jobs are run and, and how responsive the system is. So as we sort of move towards wrapping up, let's briefly discuss okay, how might your work be impacted if, um, you know, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some sort of trends and uh, key takeaways. And this is just something to think about uh, in terms of if you don't implement best practices, if you don't implement good governance, what are some, you know, just keep in mind what, what the risks to that might be. And, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, I wrote Leslie's best practices. I just wanted to think about like things that uh, that I think are, are important to consider when you're like, how does how is FME, FME gonna play a role in my broader GIS governance? And one of them is understanding the different roles the platform plays. Like I think it's it's good to have a tactical kind of view of where FME plays the best, um, you know, is it going to be, you know, you know, where where are its best use cases in your organization, in your GIS, in your needs? Um, implement with purpose. I think that I mean I have been implementing FME server since um, it first began, um, so it's been many years. And I think that at first people would be like, oh, we have desktop. Oh, we're going to get FME server and we're going to do some stuff on it. And when they didn't implement with purpose, like not with like a strategy or a tactical approach, at least, um, you know, then we ended up with like many workspaces. And some of them, nobody knew what they do. And many times I have sat down with somebody and actually gone through all of their content and, um, you know, uh, tried to figure out what was good and not good. And uh, so that's that's definitely like implement with purpose is something that we do actively with clients now, um, because the idea is that it always starts small when it's small and you have one workspace on FME server, it's very easy to govern and manage. And when you have, you know, three, four, five hundred, um, you, you need purpose. Um, and uh, in, integrate FME into all facets of GIS governance. So again, like, you know, it does play a role in your technical strategies. It does play a role in your financial strategies. It does play a role in your workforce strategies, especially. Uh, and I like the continual improvement mindset. Um, you know, how can, so it's not static. We make a plan, but we, we, we have a actual purposeful, approach to adapting that plan and helping the the platform evolve yeah i like that last point leslie because uh this might be a bit intimidating for someone who's new to this whole concept of data governance and i think rather than sort of like oh pass fail or all or nothing the continual yeah. improvement is you can always start somewhere if you start you know cataloging your data or or validating it uh you know anything is better than just kind of driving blind so we probably have to wrap up in the next two minutes. Uh, we'll just, I just wanted to jump through this really quick and these slides are available afterwards, but uh, I, just, I just wanted to emphasize in terms of trends, what good governance enables. Uh, certainly it enables efficiency through things like automation, uh, better collaboration. So if you're using things like open standards, it's easier to share data, uh, return on investment. Uh, so ultimately you're, level of maintenance or struggling with bad data should go down and so your systems should be more efficient and we haven't talked too much about it but in terms of risk management i guess leslie you had a good good example from Sudbury, you know with the with the data lineage uh you've if you've got good governance then then uh that that actually protects you as well as, well as things like from hacking or security and the last one i'm just going to briefly highlight here before we wrap up is innovation. So there's a lot of innovation that really depends on good quality data, things like BIM, digital twins, and what we don't really have time to get into are things like uh, uh, artificial intelligence would be another example. So 
Here, I'm not going to go through these in much detail, but uh, just to show you some examples of uh, digital twins at airports, uh, we have you know, a number of customers of ours using FME to support building, first of all, building their BIM and then uh, making them essentially bringing them to life with real time data. And uh, they've got this uh, um, digital twin that allows them to manage the life of the airport. And the same thing here at Schiphol, where they're using the IFC standard, uh, essentially an enterprise service bus that lets them, if a runway light goes out, there's a message that generates, goes through that service bus and generates a work order. Uh, so there's presentations on this. And then once you have that infrastructure, you can do fun things like build apps, custom apps that allow people to get to where they need to go or find the services, uh, if they're shopping that they need. So just in terms of lessons learned, last minute or two here, um, yeah, automation basically powers your data flow uh, with things like, uh, you know, using standards like BIM, uh, supports uh, collaboration. So indoor mapping, now you can use a lot of different apps uh, and, you know, your data shows up in Apple Maps or Google Maps if you, you support the appropriate standard. ROI, and I think I've kind of covered most of these here. Um, and then, Leslie, you, you talked about things like staff turnover and uh, yep. institutional yep. knowledge. So I think it protects the organization. So, yeah, just the key takeaways here. Um, there's this concept of if you do base internal standards, like uh, San Francisco with the ACI airport uh, standard, and if they're, by basing their internal standards on that, it allows them to better comply with uh, external standards as well. Um, and then ba ultimately, it's the bottom line there. FME helps you implement uh, your governance policies by giving you control over your data management. So whatever that policy might be in terms of managing the life cycle, uh, access control, authorship, lineage, um, FME gives you the, the tools you need to implement that. Yeah, I think that's, did you have anything to add there, uh, Leslie? No, I think you wrapped it up pretty w well, and it's kind of like based on the previous discussions we were having the last few days, so I'm pretty happy. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of uh, resources there, again, available in the deck if you download it. And uh, there's, you know, everything from working with metadata, there's a great blog there, uh, like I think, uh, and presentations by Leslie uh, at past uh, FME events and some webinars. So yeah, feel free to dig in and uh, don't be a stranger. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, did you have anything to add to wrap up? Yeah, so we do have a community badge code this morning. Um, I'll drop that in the chat. If you aren't a part of the community, it's a great place to connect with other users and a lot of great resources there. Um, and early bird registration is open for the peak of data integration as well. So definitely check that out. I'll drop the link for that shortly if you haven't registered yet. That's in Europe this year. And with that, we might take a quick glance at the Q&A, but it does look like we've answered most questions. Uh, there was a question about how is the XML used, and there were two XML examples. I wasn't sure which one, but the first one, it, the XML data is basically... I think it's probably a yeah feature service um, writer that updates the metadata there afterwards in a in a separate workflow and yeah but you're yeah like somebody was asking about the workspaces so um, Elizabeth will will send it out an update I suppose uh, which will have uh, the complete examples attached. Yeah, and now Dean, are we thinking that's going to include the this specific workspace that's up on the screen here? No, that I think uh, the I think that's a survey one two three, so that would probably be uh, Leslie's example. Yeah, I mean it's I it's have. it's it's a corporate example. I'd have to see if I'd be allowed to, you know, it, 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 if if they would be willing to share it. Um, it's actually not that difficult to do, to use the webhooks. It's actually a few like clicks, very low to no code at all. I've given uh, workshops on it for uh, ERISA uh, at Be Spatial last year. 
on how to webhook Survey123, um, you might be able to actually look that stuff up there, actually. Awesome. There was a question right at the top that we didn't answer yet from Grafton Tech about, you know, in uh, your opinion, what are some of the key drivers for data for organizations to pursue good good governance? And I know that um, there's the governing organization. So sometimes there are legal requirements like next, next Gen 911 or the EU Inspire legislation. So that kind of almost forces you to pursue good governance. But the flip side is, you know, might just simply be profitability. If you, you know, you don't want to waste money, you don't want to waste your data resources. So it might be your shareholders that <laughs> want you to have good governance or you don't want the liability of, you know, somebody hacking your data. So you need, you know, good governance on security. So there's quite a few... Um, but that's a, you know, it's a very good question. And you have to think yourself about, that's part of what that slide about what happens if you don't do data governance, what's, what's your risk? And, uh, you know, data is a, a very valuable resource. So you do have to manage it well and be intentional. And Leslie, you were talking about uh, with purpose, you have to be intentional and you can't do everything. So maybe that's one of the challenges is, okay, how do you prioritize? I don't know, Leslie, if you think think about that. If you were starting with a blank slate, what do you prioritize for governance? Yeah, um, I think, well, I mean, I think I like the idea of a sort of like having that uh, traceability. I mean, I think like, you know, a lot of people don't talk about metadata a lot, but I think like knowing where your data came from is like probably a good start, like cataloging, inventorying, just, just to have an inventory. I think, you know, and there are some, it doesn't have to be the best inventory. I think you need to start with something. Um, I think that one of the drivers for governance too is the idea that like before we would make a map and we would highly curate the data, like a GIS professional would sit behind their desk and analyze the data and make sure it's good, make sure it's good, make sure it's good, and then finally deliver the data. Now these things are integrated live into other systems. So I think that that actually, that automation aspect, that ability to deliver data pretty immediately for decision-making, I think honestly, that's been that's been a big driver too. Yeah, and I, like you're saying, the metadata is key, and nobody wants to sit there and fill out metadata forms. So that that update has to be automated. It has to be part of the data update is the metadata update. And now you know, well, is this current data or is it 10 years old? And you know, if you're driving in an ambulance, you don't you don't want to go down a street and figure out that well, you know, there's no more bridge there anymore, or something's missing, or something's blocking it. Uh, yeah, so it has to be up to date. In terms mm -hmm. of metadata, we did put out a webinar uh, roughly a year ago, so you, you're welcome to check that one out. And there's a, a number of uh, data examples and workspaces attached to that. Mm, I'll drop that in the chat as well. Certainly come out to the, if you're based in uh, Europe, come come on out and see us. Yeah. I guess it's in, is it in Bonn or Berlin? Bonn. 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 Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And if you do have a moment to fill out our webinar survey, we really appreciate it. It lets us continually improve upon the program with any feedback there. It's just a few multiple choice questions. And with that, a huge thank you to our presenters today, Dean and Leslie. Thanks for joining me on this webinar and all your work creating this content. Um, we really appreciate it. And a big thank you to our whole audience for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. And hope yeah. you have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone Thank for you your everybody. time and thanks Leslie for all your great examples and insights. Thanks guys. Awesome. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye for now. Bye bye. Have a good day.